So I wanted to say, like, having read your book, I, although you obviously have felt a lot of pain and shame as being a gay man, it's important for me to tell you that actually your journey kind of helped me a lot when I was growing up because I don't think I was that far behind you. But seeing you come out in the sort of dignified way you did, did actually have a profound effect on me. So I think it would have done that for a lot of people, as I'm sure you know. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. And that's always... I mean, it's it's quite a special thing to hear that, you know. Um, I think sometimes, particularly being like a known person, one can forget the like how powerful, just you know, like something that we might have done that might support another individual without us even knowing. And yeah. so when I say I do appreciate that, I I, I genuinely, you know, do. Okay, shall we do yeah. the interview now? <laughs> At the, at the very beginning of the book, you said that um, your, the gay shame that you have has stopped you and you used the phrase flying in life. And I just wonder what, what you mean by that and, and what you think, where you could have been flying if you, you hadn't had this shame. You know, when we have things that keep us down in life, you know, and they're quite particularly things from our past or things that have been put on us normally from childhood that we didn't even have a choice about. So like we're disempowered and we're, and we're, you know, we don't even know why we're being held back because what it leads to is opinions about ourselves, low self-esteem. And if you don't have good self-esteem and confidence and belief in yourself, it's going to be very difficult to do things, you know. Um, it's difficult to set boundaries in relationships. It's difficult to um, assert yourself at work. You know, the list just goes on and on. Um, so that's what I mean by that. You know, I had... I, there was a part of me that that in relation to my sexuality but then it spilt out into my whole being that I was you know effectively wrong and defect because those were the messages that came you know flooding thick and fast from the age of f six when I sort of preferred Bobby Ewing to Pam yeah. <laughs> and, and this Pam is also awesome. taken by aliens and I couldn't have been happier I thought she's out <laughs> And this is kind of what, gay, I mean, you've summed up gay shame in a way there. That's exactly what gay shame is. It's something that you don't even realize you've, you've had put on you. And even though you don't realize you're gay at such a young age, um, it's like in Nanette, you know, um, shame, the closet isn't shame proof and, and it leaks through. And before you know it, you grow up and you're unable to do things because you sort of feel and uh, nervous and ashamed of who you are. I remember not being able to order yes. a coffee at Starbucks. I was so nervous of my choice that they'd think I was gay or something. It's oh ridiculous. my God, yeah. I know, and it, it sounds so, it can seem so ridiculous, but I remember being so paranoid that I was wearing red New Balance trainers wow. from the age of 18. Weird that I didn't care about the floral shirts that I used to wear. I didn't know what that was about. <laughs> For some reason, I was obsessed with these red trainers that I kept on wearing. But um, what is it about red New Balance trainers that equals? God knows. I don't, I don't know. It was just so. But that was just my fixation. And it sounds so, you know, it feels so silly. But yeah. that was my fixation was that that is going to be a thing that's going to make people see that I'm gay and you must not be visible. You know, because if you're visible, the shame and the social exclusion from that, you know, there's a reason why suicide rates are almost double amongst young gay men in comparison to young straight men and then transgender is almost almost triple mm. you know there's a reason for that yeah um sorry to dampen the mood <laughs> no it's so important i mean we had a listener recently say how do i remove the shame i'm experience, uh, experiencing oh, really? and it's really hard to answer that and the best way i put it was that actually it's not it's not you that's you've been given it like society's put that yes. on you so yeah. you kind of just have to know that and move forwards as much as you can but it is it's yeah. tough to get through that it is it's tough and the first thing is to realize it and that took you know i didn't even realize it was there till i was 32 and i read a book called the velvet rage and it was a very good book i didn't i took a few key points and i think if you can take a few key points from any of those kind of self-help books brilliant you're winning i didn't massively relate to the chap he's a therapist and I wanted to write a book where it's I felt like you know I'd rather I'd rather 
hear from someone who was a client, not the therapist, and has got through it. Um, and so once I realised I had it, it, it was like expunging. It was like an excommunication. And um, it took me two years. Yeah, I got a lovely message from a friend. Uh, and I didn't even realise he had been working through gay shame during lockdown. It had obviously come up. And he just sent me the most amazing message. And I thought, wow, my job's done. You know? Wow. I was so pleased that he felt he had permission to share it. And quite often we need to feel safe. And if we hear someone else say, gosh, you know what? I feel like that. It gives permission to someone else because so often we don't want to share anything that's seen as negative because we don't know how people are going to handle it. And there's nothing worse than being invalidated or ignored when we share something very vulnerable about ourselves. So quite often we need permission to then be able to share that. And that's kind of what the book is. And yeah. if, if you are listening and you don't know what it is, like, I want to talk about some of the nuances about how that creeps in to us because um you talk about how the papers would say someone has uh let me just read it back because I'm gonna get it wrong. That's it. You talk about yeah. how the papers have said people have admitted that they're gay, almost kind of suggesting that there's wrongdoing in there. Yes, I know. And I I don't think they use that word anymore. Um oh good you're still here. Um I don't think they use that word anymore. But I mean yeah little things like that language makes such a such a difference you know i'm gay but i'm just normal you know something right. like that it's like well that's negative or whatever um and I, I think um yeah i think it was very interesting to look at i mean obviously then a lot of things that happened to me in the papers were a lot more explicit than that you know i mean i was accused of i mean one paper they basically said i was abusing boys at school because I was gay and I was part of this sort of ring I mean it was really dark and um and you but the thing is you didn't have recourse to do anything there there was no legal recourse you know and if, certainly if I'd ever tried to even as late as like 2010 try and get some kind of you know make an example of it I would have just been seen as whinging you know and it would have really damaged my career you know, now, now, thank God, it's so, so different. But yeah, when I look back at some of the things, my God, it was like, it was crazy. I can't believe that, that as gay people, we would put up with that, all that kind of shit. I mean, yeah. man, I swear. Sorry. Yeah, of course. You know, I can't believe we put up with that. I mean, it, it makes me so happy that we, it's so much better now. But I mean, honestly, there was things like, Will's being difficult and he's ordering pink towels on tour. You know, why was it pink towels? You know, Will's, uh, oh gosh, I mean, there's so many things. Chris Miles, you know, awful about me on Radio 1 to like 8 million people. I mean, how many people listen to that show? Like, it could be a kid. You know, it could be the kid en route to school, you know, people in the workplace and you're hearing a gay person being ridiculed. I think it was Jewish people the day before. Um, oh, really? Wow. Yeah, as he was rocking through them. Um, <laughs> You know, and the BBC didn't really care. They really didn't care. Like I, I, I got the um, communication between because I did get my lawyer in touch then, and I got the communication. They couldn't have been more like laissez faire about the whole thing. And actually, I said I actually think I'm owed a proper apology, like I do proper too. apology. You know, I do too. And so, uh, so I don't think that ever really happened. So I think that's probably the only thing in the book that I'm potentially still a little bit bitter about um, so this is on radio one and the host of the breakfast show basically he used the word gay a lot on air as a derogatory term anyway but also just fired yes. as you put it a rampage of homophobia at you yeah, it was very it was very odd and i think he sort of feels that i don't know it's not against him i think but i think it was so important to mention him and that event because people can't believe it and i think we have to look we have to look at history to know what happened back then because then we can spot the signs so for example um you know look at trump you know you think oh something like hitler will never happen again ever 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 that's not true because it was in a time of economic downturn he wrote a massive piece of propaganda it then got supported by ford in the us um 
and people were looking for reasons post World War One as to why, you know, the economy the way it was. And you get people when they're scared and they're down. Those kind of things happen again, and you create polarized politics, and you get persecution. So we've got to look at history to learn and spot the signs for the future. And and I look at transgender people, and I see what's going on with them now is very similar to, I think, what was happening with gay people 10, 15 years ago. I'm guessing Chris Miles hasn't reached out and apologised since since the book's come out or, or tried to get in touch or anything. No, and I don't think I'm really looking for that. Um, I, he did try and apologise at the time, and that's fine. I didn't realise quite what was said then. I haven't, so, I honestly have not harboured this sort of grudge against him. I I think he's probably quite a reformed person and I don't think it will come as a surprise and he wasn't necessarily liked by a lot of people, you know, and he had a bit of a fall from grace. That happens to all of us. I'm sure he's done some soul searching and I'm sure he's a very different person. So it would be so like stupid and immature of me to go on some rampage against him. Uh, but I do think the BBC as an institution and Radio 1 were not, were not kind actually and didn't take it seriously enough and I think they should have even at that stage but I was too nervous because I didn't want to be banned suddenly or just you know get it's an interesting example of when you see where the power is you look at something like the Me Too movement I know people that you know singers that I work with who have worked female singers who have worked with other artists and they have had awful things happen to them recently but they don't talk about it because they want to work, they've got kids, you know, oh. and and that was part of my concern, um, is that I wanted to work. So it's just, it's, no, it's just really, it's really interesting to explore and see what it was like then. You talk about love addiction in your book. Um, I feel like I've experienced that, but I'd love you to sort of spell it out for people that don't know what that is. Yeah, I tried to spell it out to this really nice journalist, but I think I was a bit hungover and I don't think I did a very good job. Um, which I was disappointed about, but so love addiction, this is what I believe is a sign of love addiction. I meet someone, I come back, I ring you guys up and I go, guys, this is the one. Everything feels right in my world. Suddenly everything is kind of relating to this person. I think this is it, you know, and uh, this is what I've been waiting for. We spend a lot of time together very quickly. You know, oh my God, he moved in within three dates. Honestly, we've already, been, <laughs> we've already been talking about marriage. Guys, can't believe it. You can both be my best men. And uh, and then after five weeks, it all comes crashing down. So that is what I call a big adrenaline spike. Or actually, if you have abandonment stuff in your life from the past, when when... I will meet someone who is very likely to abandon me emotionally. There's a massive spike in my body. But what, what I do is I think that that's love. I'm like, oh, I feel like this rush of emotions is love. It's not actually, it's me being triggered back into that anxious state of being abandoned. And it's very difficult to get out of. And it is quite complicated, but really that's what a love, addi a love addiction is and when i hear that from someone else oh my god i've met this person we just we hung out all weekend i'm like this ain't gonna work this ain't gonna work it's all gonna come crashing down um and 99 percent of the time it does it took me a long time to realize that what i thought was love was actually just a heightened reaction to someone who is completely not right for me does that did that make sense yeah, 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 oh, yeah, sort of. I, what's interesting, when it happens once or twice, by the third time, do you not think, uh, alarm bell's not going off going, yeah, I've, I've been here before, I know this story. Well, it does if you're wanting to be mindful and change things and notice things in your life. Um, the thing is that what happens is our nervous systems, when we're abandoned a lot, and we have funny attachment, uh, you know, not, not healthy attachment to our primary caregivers. Oh, I really feel like a therapist. You really sound like one. You sound I've like had, mine. I've had shitloads of therapy. <laughs> you know, when our attachment to our primary caregivers was um, stunted 
for whatever reason, our nervous system believes, so it's not our mind, that that is actually love. So when we meet someone that is going to do that same kind of attachment with us, our bodies think that's love because that's all we ever experienced. So to change that, we need to be really mindful of our bodies, not our minds. When we meet someone, if I meet someone and I'm like, he's a lawyer, he's got a sausage dog, he, he's got money, he seems very calm, this is perfect. If I, I have to tune in with my body and if my body's screaming and I'm like, nope, not the one, even though he looks like a model. Oh my God. I mean, it's funny, Dan, you said that because you've, you've been on this podcast, so you've heard me go through exactly the same thing. Yeah, no, I, I have, but I just yeah. I still don't really understand how it, how it works. It's weird. Um, it's like listening to yeah. myself really well. Uh, and it, what upsets <laughs> me about that is that I don't understand why someone with a completely different life to you can have so many of the same experiences. And it's purely because of all of the shame and all of the bullshit that we have to go through as not always, people, right? It's not just, it doesn't just necessarily have to be because of one's sexuality, you know, definitely we can relate, you know, love addiction can come from gay shame, but it could come also from attachment stuff in my past, you know, trauma in my past. And, but what I think so wonderful is that we actually are all quite similar as people. And, you know, it would be so much better if when we turned up, you know, for dinner with friends, and they go, how are you? Rather than going, oh, I'm a bit tired at the moment. You know, you go, well, you know what? Uh, you know, my mum was a bitch to me this week, and it's really brought up stuff about the past. And this hasn't happened to me, by the way. And um, <laughs> hey, she's watching and listening, Annabelle. Um, you know, and someone goes, yeah, I get that. My mum's like that. And I have that with some friends now. And it's not intense. It's not like, oh, my God. We just have a laugh about it. And I just wish we are actually very similar, a lot of us. We all actually do have a lot of similar inner worlds. We just don't we just don't. We just don't open up. Before you came out, so rewinding quite a bit, before you came out, um, sort of on the cusp of this incredible career that you've had, did you ever think... Do you know what? It's going to be easier if I'm just don't come out. Just just set myself up with a a, a fake sugar babe relationship or a fake because I'm an atomic kitten. Relationship. Of um, or whoever was around at the time, uh, eternal. <laughs> I mean, just, love the sugar babes. <laughs> you could have, you could have saved Louise from eternal. Yeah. I could have. Oh my God, I could have gone out with it. Could have saved it from Jamie Redknapp. Yeah. Um, uh, I. No, because I'd already come out at university. And I was just like, God, that would just be such hard work. Yeah. I know people that have done it. You know, people that we probably all know, but we won't, I won't talk about it. It's not my place to talk for them. You know, and I just thought, God, that must be exhausting. And also, you must feel so ashamed, you know, pretending the whole time. Um, so the idea of doing that, I just thought would be so tiring. Um, but you know what's really interesting? When I... Like years later, someone pitched, not years later, but a couple of years later, someone, so I'd been like out as a famous gay man for two years or something. And someone pitched a video for me running down the beach with a girl in hand in hand. And I was like, oh my God, I really hope that they don't know that I'm gay. Cause otherwise this is the craziest thing. <laughs> it's the craziest thing I've ever been. You know, I just, I actually couldn't believe it. I thought, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> who was the girl? I don't know, she's probably quite fit. I mean, I don't know. We never got that far. We never That's got so... past the horse. <laughs> the horse on the beach as well. So. Did you consider it then? Did people suggest this to you as an idea? Because you said then you thought it would be exhausting as though you had considered it. It was a little bit because it was during this show Pop Idol that I was on. It's a big talent show. Kind of launched all the other ones. And it was the final week and it was becoming more and more kind of prevalent that everyone knew I was gay anyway. And they, they just sort of said, well, if they ask you, don't say, because it will, it will overtake and overshadow the final. And I sort of got that, but I did stand my ground. And I went, if someone asked me, I haven't gone through all that shit at university to then deny it. I was like, that is, so in a way I was quite, it was weird because 
because from coming out I was quite like forthright about it I just had a huge backlog of shame which I didn't realize you know so yeah. I was quite like that's what confused me because I was quite like I'm not going to take any of this crap but I didn't realize there was a huge hangover of shame from all those years of just being battered constantly you know of not physically, but you know, just all the messages, AIDS, HIV, you're gonna die, you know, you're wrong, you're perverse, it's a gay plague, you should all be round and killed, you know, all those things. So, but weirdly, like day to day, I was quite like, screw you. My best ever moment, can I tell you my best ever moment? Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> Outside a pub in Hampstead, and um, these, these kids turned up in a Vauxhall Nova. Um, <laughs> you know, with like a, it was low slung and had like a, a exhaust that made it sound, you know, more powerful than it was. And I'm a bit of a car snob. I was like, at least get a Peugeot, you know. 206. <laughs> at least get, at least get a Peugeot. Peugeot. <laughs> um, you know, a Golf GTI, come on. Um, and they shouted faggot at me. And I, so I just shouted back at them, faggot. <laughs> great, great, they, great they, comeback. They, they, went, <laughs> they, they went batty boy, and I went batty boy. And they were really confused. And they were like, "Oh, oh no, I don't know what to do." So they drove off. <laughs> that is absolutely brilliant. Like just it say the so, same thing back. It was so funny. It was That's amazing. Yeah, because they just that... I tried it again, and then someone tried to beat me up, so it only worked once. But oh, really? Oh, no. okay. But, uh, no, it was very funny. Very. What's funny. What's your second favorite moment? Uh, singing with James Brown. Right. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's sorry. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, James Brown. You're not quite <laughs> as fun as homophobia. <laughs> um, no. R.I.P. Did you enjoy being back on a podcast, Will? Yeah. Oh, I do. I. I do like podcasts. It became too busy doing Homo Sapiens and Chris Sweeney, who I was doing it with. He now does it with Alan Cumming, which I think is a pretty good upgrade, I have to say. Um, <laughs> you know. And I'm, I'm, I think that's why they've got a lot more famous people on the show this year. <laughs> but, but I do miss it. I miss I miss speaking with people. Um, well, anytime, if I'm off sick or whatever, and you want to cover, and you can, you oh, can be the gay, on a gay and a non-gay, you're very oh, welcome to very come much. back. Yeah. It I got a politics degree too, Will. Oh, yeah. What is your, what did you get, Dan? I got a 2-1. <laughs> oh, there you go. But literally only, only just, I just scraped it and actually made no difference to my life, but <laughs> I did get a 2-1. Can I ask, what do you enjoy about your podcast before I go? What, oh, my God. The about? power of helping people. Like, it makes me cry all the time the messages we receive from people that we've helped without knowing it. It's crazy. It's, and it feels like it's almost like something I have to keep doing now. Yes. Um, yes. Because yes. I, I don't, the power, the words are so powerful. And, um, and even listening to you today, it's, it's magical really like knowing I'm not alone and I know other people listening will feel that too. So thank you for being so open and I know how difficult it is to get to that point. And, you know, we've both joked about all the therapy we've been through, but, oh my God, I mean, it takes so much work and it's so brave to face all your demons and be who you are. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. And it is worth it. Um, and I do relate to that. I felt like the podcast became, it was more about, it was something that I never expected that it became a real purpose and um, it became much bigger than myself. It was about suddenly these people that were writing in, relating and and also it was our own world. No one else could touch it because there are no powers that be going, you can have it on, you can't have it on. Yeah. And you created this little sort of family, I guess. It was re really, really special. 